Welcome to Stemiverse Podcast, episode 20. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Matt Richards. Matt is an education and creative director, learning innovation leader, and educational technologist. He has 10 years experience creating innovative learning environments, high-performing teams, and education programs in schools, social enterprise, and government organizations. Most recently, the new Hinatore Learning Lab at New Zealand's National Museum. Matt employs emerging technologies to empower learners to build global learning communities. He's a Google Certified Innovator and Microsoft Innovative Education Expert. This is Stemiverse Podcast Episode 20. Welcome to Stemiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dunmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. So here we are, Marcus, uh, another Steniverse mm-hmm. episode. We are That's back correct. at the Steniverse lab slash... Um, uh, hideout, hideout, Den. cave. Yeah, what are those? Yeah, yes, we, we spend a lot of time here, and today we are here with Matt Richards from New Zealand. I think uh, Matt, you are in Auckland, right? Uh, hi guys, I'm in Wellington now. I've been here for a bit over two years. Wellington, uh, orig- originally from Australia. Awesome. Which part of Australia? I was born in Newcastle, uh, just above Sydney, uh, but I've lived in quite a few places. Um, Melbourne, Byron Bay, uh, Port Macquarie, just before here in New Zealand. Right. So I wonder what took you there, but we can touch that later. <laughs> okay. Cool. What, what took you to New Zealand? So um, could you please take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you can go as far back as you like in childhood. I find that the time in our life quite fascinating to seems to shape our future life if you like you can talk about that and take us all the way to today to what you do now okay well i i was born in uh, newcastle australia the first child of an engineer and uh, a university administrator and um i i showed an early interest in uh, computers i suppose because of my dad who was always bringing home those early sort of vic 20 commodore 64 kind of models and um, it wasn't until much later that I actually um, really got into computers and technology, um, mainly from a creative perspective. Uh, I wanted to make um, electronic music, something that had never been made before. And so this was back before, you know, laptops. We used to lug our big desktops around to gigs and do these really abstract uh, musical performances um, but my life's been, it, it's been a series of adventures and um, I've had a, a few different careers. Uh, I ran my own African and Latin drum school for a while called Pan Percussion and um, worked in publishing, uh, worked as a multimedia consultant. And it was, it was later in life that I decided I really wanted to get into education Anything in particular happened that prompted uh, you to Yeah, do? there was actually. I was working as a, a freelance um, multimedia guy at the time. What is multimedia? <laughs> uh, I You're was, dating yourself. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, I was making websites, doing graphic design kind of work, a little bit of um, psychometric testing. It was, I was doing loads of weird things at the time. But um, my girlfriend at the time, she ran a before and after school care um, service for kids at a school. And uh, she asked if I could help out one day because she was really short staffed. And um, I said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll come and, you know, help you out. And it just reminded me so much of um, the joy of uh, working with kids and and being able to be playful um, in a learning context. I thought it was really cool. So I went back to school, to university, and got a teaching um, qualification on top of my Bachelor of Arts degree. And yeah, then this latest phase of my life began. So when, when about was that? Oh, geez. Uh, I became a teacher about 10 years ago hmm. um, and got a, a dip ed 
and became a primary school teacher. And this was in Melbourne at the time. And um, I quickly specialised in schools to be the um, the IT computer teacher of the school. And um, I moved states and went to uh, Port Macquarie to work in a, a K-12 school as the um, director of uh, IT and then I, I was the director of innovation. And um, that was where I ended up making the first uh, permanent K-12 makerspace in, in Australian schools uh, in Port Macquarie. And after that, the notoriety that sort of came with that, um, I, I ended up getting a job here in um, Wellington, New Zealand, setting up the Wellington branch of a, a company called the Mind Lab. Mm-hmm. So I did that for about a year. And then about a year and three or four months ago, um, I was asked by the National Museum of New Zealand if I'd um, join them and create an innovative learning environment in a national museum. And that's what I've been doing for the last year and a bit um, and have created Hina Tore Learning Lab at Te Papa. So that's that's the abbreviated life story for you guys. Awesome. Tell us about Maker Labs or Maker Spaces. Because you mentioned you did the first one in Port Macquarie. So yeah, could you describe with? the time? And yeah, what did you do? That was that was um, Saint Columba Anglican School hmm. um, in Port Macquarie. Yeah, K to twelve school. It was a it was a really interesting story that one because um, I was managing the library, IT, e learning teams. Um, of the school and the building that we occupied by teams was the library and um, over a a school holiday break we decided to completely change it Um, we we called it the hub and um, and it became uh, an information nexus or hub and upstairs we knocked down all the walls and we made a maker space so Matt just to just to make sure I've, I've got this so you had a library and you decided to turn it into something else? Yeah. And right. you started by knocking down walls and <laughs> yeah. re so, Why? Yeah, so, what, what was uh, the problem with the library? Um, well, the upstairs section that we converted, um, they'd put up, the school had been around, and it was fairly new school, it was only about 10 years old, and over the years they'd put up these temporary walls and it was kind of reflective of the old form uh-huh. of education really like you yeah. you box things up and you, you, you compartmentalize the space and so the, it was a whole bunch of little dingy horrible spaces and so we knocked those down and we made it one big space although in the corner I built myself like a little fishbowl we called it because it was just this sort of glass wall where I sat at my desk behind it and there was a reason for that because um I realised that I would need in the early stages to facilitate the space. So um, I had it open at all times. So before school, after school, lunch, recess, obviously ran classes in there as well. Um, but it ended up being this phenomenon of um, it was a new learning model that that grew out of that. Um, and we had, you know, kids in year one teaching kids in year 12 uh, how to use the 3D printer or how to use Tinkercad to create a model or um, it was this great uh, cross, cross-generational, cross-cohort learning commons, we ended up calling it. And um, eventually, I didn't have to physically be there myself all the time because there was a group of kids that called themselves the Tech Ninjas that um, ended up running the space. And that was a great story, actually, with the Tech Ninjas as well because once we first set up the maker space and we didn't have much money, So we were basically repurposing furniture and people were giving us 3D printers and things like that. And there was a group of kids that were sort of naturally predisposed to tech stuff that were obviously there as often as they could be, you know, skipping uh, literacy classes and things like that. And um, what we found was that um, they were super uh, passionate and high skilled. And so they started teaching each other and it was this, this exponential sort of learning curve was occurring. And we realised that we we needed to share the love a bit more. So the Tech Ninjas set up a a Tech Ninja help desk. And so every lunch and recess, kids 
who weren't tech ninjas could come and get assistance with their devices. We were the first school to have BYOD uh, from K to 12. So there was a multiplicity of devices in the school. So the kids were servicing each other's sort of devices and teaching each other. And then we realised that um, that a lot of the teachers, we had a lot of teachers in this school, needed help too. So uh, we created a Tech Ninja sticker and the kids had that on the back of their laptop or their tablet or their device. And when they're in a class, the teacher could identify who the Tech Ninjas were. So if they were having a problem with their interactive whiteboard or their TV or whatever, it'd be a ninja to the rescue and a kid <laughs> could literally jump up in the class and start teaching the teacher. And so we found that this amazing transformation happened in, in uh, who we considered to be learners and who we considered to be teachers. And I just thought that it was this beautiful process. And I suppose even cooler than that was that a lot of the kids um, I was finding that, that were really creating some amazing creations, projects, uh, inventions – a lot of the time were the kids that were not achieving in the standard classroom. They were the, the kids that were in trouble all the time. That's so interesting. And all of a sudden, they were the heroes of this space. Um, and so I just think it was amazing. And so, yeah, that was my first proper makerspace. That's pretty cool. Was all that, like, premeditated or planned? When you started knocking down those library walls, did you foresee, like, those kids coming into... Uh, this, the, the new role that they had all of a sudden of being the teachers? And the- um, to be quite honest, most of it was a, was a beautiful surprise. And what, what started the process was um, I was watching the, um, the beginnings of the maker movement uh, in, the, in the States and I was seeing uh, a couple of different teachers and librarians uh, that were doing some really cool stuff. And that sort of inspired me to just have a go. And I think... That spirit of being in constant beta or just having a go and testing something, I think that's sort of the lifeblood of a real makerspace or an innovative learning environment is that there is no set model. Like there'll be a 100 people out there right now that will have a model to sell you, right, for a makerspace. And I'll go, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is the toolkit you need to be as successful. But the, the makerspace isn't, is, isn't even a space. It, it's a mindset. It's how you think about things. But I would say even more importantly, it's about people. And a makerspace can happen anywhere with anything. We, we literally started off with old Windows desktops that the parents brought in that were broken. And so the kids took them apart. They learned what the CPU was and the motherboard and the RAM and fans. And, and then they would make these we called them franken machines so they would they would make they would make these botched together computers yeah and sometimes they worked and um a lot of the time they didn't and that was okay too and um it was about being uh, explorers and and finding um a real joy in figuring out how something worked and I think that's what a makerspace is. I, I, I don't think it needs to be defined by what the tech is in the space or what the walls or the, or the furniture look like. It's about being inventors. Having said that, the tech that Columba has now is pretty awesome. I was there a couple of years ago with uh, Jeff Lancaster and uh, yeah. Daniel Zavon. Yeah. And what they're doing with, uh, I guess, robotics and programming is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, those guys are really cool. I enjoyed working with them. Matt, could, could you take a step back? Uh, I know you said that uh, Makerspace could be anything, but what makes a Makerspace special, say, to a classroom? I suppose both a classroom and a Makerspace, their objective is to learn. But what's the difference between those two? Okay, well, firstly, I think a classroom can be a makerspace and vice versa. Hmm. So I don't think that it's um, – we, we like to box things, don't we? Like we like hmm. to categorize and say this is the attributes of a classroom and this is the attributes of a makerspace. But if I was to say generally, okay, if we were to think about a general classroom, most of the, the physical arrangement of the furniture, the focal points in the room – those things are working historically off a, a teacher-centric model. Hmm. So it's it's a it's an environment where 
the focus of the attention usually this is changing in a lot of really progressive schools now but but in a lot of the schools that haven't caught up yet the focus is at the front of the room at the teacher with their presentation space and a maker space a good maker space is not like that at all. So it's it's multiple points of creation and learning where numerous activities can occur concurrently and where everyone can follow their own passions, interests in their own time. So I think pedagogically, or if you if we really want to get serious, we talk hudagogically, I think it's a makerspace is a place that really supports differentiated personalized learning. And but but that said, that should be what a classroom is too. So and and good classrooms do do that. So um, I I just don't think that I, I think it's limiting if we if we start to think of makerspace equals tech because it doesn't need to. But that said, technology and particularly transformative educational technologies that have come out in the last say five years have acted as a catalyst for personalised learning. So, so I think if we approach this with learning first, technology second approach, we can do some amazing things. And, yeah, let me know if you want me to unpack any of those things. Yeah, well, well I was, was going to ask you, if I'm a teacher, <laughs> where should I start in either turning my classroom into a makerspace or creating a new makerspace in a dedicated mm area of the school. And I suppose, uh, just to add to that, as, as a maker, I suppose the idea is that you learn by making, right? So do you think that a makerspace should have particular kinds of tools or raw materials for making or not really? What do you think? Uh, yeah. So, um, so I'll come down from my high philosophical uh, <laughs> stage at the moment and I'll talk sort of basics. So the first question I heard from you guys then was, um, where would a teacher set a start? Um, and I see a makerspace as uh, having uh, some vital elements. And yes, having uh, resources and tools for making, I think, is, is necessary. But I also think that there needs to be a different approach pedagogically or, for, or from a learning perspective in, in how those tools are utilised. And so, um, and I don't think you can separate them. So I think uh, if you took some of these tools into the old model of learning and you get everyone to do a procedural text and everyone learns how to do this first and then that second and then you make a product at the end of it and you get rated out of 10 via product and that's that's a standard kind of a lesson. Whereas I think if you set up activities that could have multiple outcomes and I think the thing you value is the process rather than the product of what you're making. It changes the value system quite dramatically. So we used a, I've used this both in schools and in the museum and in social enterprise, um, a framework of uh, those core competencies. So you would have heard the, the four C's or the five C's or the seven C's that's going around at the moment. Um, but I liked the four, the four C's, so communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. Right. And I think they're lifelong learner skills that can underpin any curriculum, any um, project-based learning activity, any learning program can have those embedded and they can be linked to separate key learning disciplines. You could have mathematics and, and this is, um, you know, STEM or STEAM. You could have those explicit in there. But I think if you have those elements, particularly, let's say, collaboration, then if you were exploring how computers work by uh, a parent donates two old broken desktops to your class. So you could approach that by saying, okay, well, George and Mary, you get a computer each and you can sit at your desk for the next hour and figure out how it works. Or you could have five to six kids at each computer all taking it apart at the same time, all sharing different parts of the process, maybe sharing what they already know about computers so that, you know, the kid who's already taken one apart is teaching the other kids. I think that's the new pedagogical model. It's being collaborative. It's being creative. So if I was a teacher to start, I'd say start with something super basic and get the kids working together on it. How does a teacher assess the students in this model? Well, it depends what you want to assess. So if you are assessing 
from the old way of, of thinking about what's valued, which is say um, achievement standards in the in your state or national curriculum, then you could make sure that there were certain elements that needed to be explored as part of a project. But if you were exploring what I think is far more important, such as the core competencies like collaboration and communication, well, obviously you could think of ways to assess that. Um, you could have anecdotal records or you could have video analysis, personal reflection video diaries, the way I used to do it when I was teaching year nine and 10 IST technology classes and the whole year I did project-based learning the entire year with these two um, classes and no one had done that in the school before. Mm. And they were like, how are we going to do this? Let's look at the curriculum. So I'd open up the curriculum, which is a 10 year old document <laughs> that's <laughs> teaching technology <laughs> and, um, and go, okay, we need to know this and this and this and this. And so what I did was I would package that into an open device exam, which is allowed. And the kids would then have to create something. So in the next hour, you've got to make a website using only web-based tools uh, for your selected target audience. And um, you have to nominate your channels for dissemination marketing. That is a test. Rather than getting them to sit down and remember the different um, specifics of a curriculum. That's just ridiculous. It's not applied knowledge. It's not, yeah. it's not real world learning. So I think that unfortunately in some countries, there still is quite a gap between what's expected from a curriculum perspective and what we actually need as a species right now. Um, if, if we want to have a chance of, you know, turning things around. Would Australia and New Zealand be included in those countries at this time? I think New Zealand the New Zealand curriculum is really cool, in my perspective. There'll be a bunch of New Zealand teachers that will disagree with me. <laughs> well, um, so what's cool about it? <laughs> um, I think it took a more holistic approach. And so they it's less prescriptive in how you achieve certain things. So you can interpret the curriculum in your own way, which has pros and cons. So for a, a teacher who's just starting, that's maybe not so crash hot because, you know, you want to have – explicit examples and do this and then that and then test this. So there's pros and cons. And I think the Australian curriculum is really getting there too. I think um, the digital curriculum sort of gone a fair way to trying to focus on uh, creating preferred futures and real skills I think that students need. I think where we haven't gone far enough, particularly in Australia and I suppose in most countries, is that we still have subjects in their silos and it's only when teachers are doing STEM or STEAM projects or things where they explicitly are doing project-based learning that they actually start approaching things in a holistic systems thinking model. And um, I think we've got a ways to go. But as you guys would probably know, the innovative teachers out there do it anyway. Even with the most restrictive, horrendous curriculum, they will still do the cool, real-world linked, awesome projects. So, in other words, like a makerspace is not just about the space, like the, the roles of traditional teachers and students is flipped where everybody's everything, right? That uh, even a traditional teacher becomes a student in such an environment. Is that what you see in practice? Yeah, totally. And, I, and but you know, this is, it's down to everyone's personal interpretation. I think that, um, all I know that there's people out there now who have written the Bible of the makerspaces and they'll say that it's this or it's that. But to be honest, it's what you want to make of it. And my personal take on a makerspace is, is that it does that. And, and what was something that was really sort of magical for me was when I came here to New Zealand and I was going through the curriculum here and I found this concept that they had. Uh, it's a Maori concept called Ako, A-K-O. And the literal translation of ako into English means learning or teaching and learning. But if you look at the deeper translation, and the Ministry of Ed actually unpacks this, it says that ako is a, a non-hierarchical reciprocal learning relationship. <laughs> what, it, what it means is that everyone brings learning that they can share with each other. And I just thought, oh, my God, this is beautiful. And this is a, 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 something that's amazing about New Zealand is the, is the biculturalism and the... Yeah. That they've taken these amazing truths and embedded it into the learning system. And so, so I got here not realizing that for the five years before I'd been preaching Akko and, and I'd been creating these, um, 
spaces and online um, experiences too. So I set up an international um, Minecraft project called Mind Class, and um, we had kids and teachers from all over the world creating together in in a shared server, Minecraft server, and um, that was what they were doing. So the the kids were teaching the teachers how to do Minecraft, and the teachers were teaching the kids in the Minecraft world design thinking, web-based project management, um, more effective communication skills, digital citizenship when griefing was occurring. So it was this beautiful, beautiful levelling experience, and I think that it, it brings in this this um, this level of humility um, that I think makes for a really special learning environment. If people, if everyone in a learning space feels like they have ownership of it, and everyone is is as important as everyone else, you're far more likely to want to share and and communicate and collaborate. So anyway, that was the one of the pillars of the the maker space that I finished about six months ago at the museum here in New Zealand. Hina Tore and um, and so yeah, Ako and empowering lifelong learners is our sort of motto, and we we provide learning experiences for everyone, so not just for school kids, but we do do school groups and um, a holiday program. We we do um, uh, game design um, after school clubs, uh, and we run sessions for adults uh, and teacher workshops and and all that thing. Is all that at the Museum of New Zealand? Yeah, that's right. So that's uh, we run these in the lab that that we've just created here. So yeah, Hina Tore, the learning lab. If you go to um, Te Papa Museum, you'll find the link to it there. Yeah, I'm looking at your blog now. There's a few pictures there that you've set up or that you've uploaded to your blog post about the museum, and um, I can see large open spaces. There's kids with devices. Uh, look like looks like smartphones. Uh, some of them are wearing. 3D goggles on their heads, so they're probably participating in some kind of virtual experience there. So it seems that museums are also transitioning, just like libraries, right? Uh, instead of just mm. a place where you go and you just look something behind a glass, you now participate in learning activities. Is that a trend that you think is like becoming stronger? Definitely. And I think um, if someone had asked me five years ago if I thought I'd ever work in a museum, I probably <laughs> would have laughed and thought, no, why would I do that? And um, my understanding of museums now is very different. And um, particularly I was lucky with Te Papa. So Te Papa has always been quite an innovative um, national museum. It's a national gallery as well, which makes it sort of even cooler and so when I started at the museum, I had this challenge that they gave to me, which was we really want to make a learning lab, Matt, and we want to make a, an innovative space that uses all the latest pedagogies and educational technologies to create empowering, transformative learning experiences. But here's the tricky bit, Matt. You need to link it to our collections. And so a museum is about objects and I historically did not care that much about objects. I, objects don't really uh, impress me so much, but what I do care about are the stories around these objects. Mm -hmm. And so what I, I realised when I was creating the first release of programs for the lab was that we were trying to tap into those 21st century core competencies, the, the four Cs, uh, create these uh, transformative tech-enabled learning experiences, but give it a cultural context, give it, give the learning something that tapped into people's culture and their, their tonga, their treasures, their cultural treasures. And what we got out of it was, has been amazing. And so I'll, I can un unpack one of the programs uh, that we run. So yep. um, please do. we had uh, a few teachers from South Auckland come to visit and their students were uh, studying Pacific people's migration, like where they'd come from. And there's a, there was a, like a large contingent of Pacific students uh, in this uh, school. And so a few of the teachers came and we took them back of house where we have most of the collection objects and they got to look at some Pacific sailing vessel models. They're called Vaka. Vaka means the second hull of a waka. A waka is a, a canoe. So they're, they're holding these models and I thought, we've got to do better than this. Like these teachers are going to go back with a picture of them holding a model <laughs> boat. And I thought that's not so inspiring to me. 
Memorable. And so, <laughs> no. And so what I did was I wrote a program called Pacific Explorers and I'll run you through a session. So the kids come in, a group of kids come in, maybe it's, um, you know, from an intermediate school, uh, maybe they're, you know, 14, something like that years old. And they'll go through the Pacific exhibition at the museum and they'll look at real uh, waka and they'll look at uh, big maps on the wall where people came from. They'll have a bit of an exploration inquiry sort of session. And then they come to the lab and in the lab, we get them to create their own waka in Tinkercad. And while they're creating that vaka in Tinkercad, they're learning that the second hole's called a, a vaka, the first one's called a waka, and they look like this from this island, but they look like that from that island. So they've made these Pacific sailing vessels. They've learnt what they are by making in a digital CAD environment. Then they can 3D print them, or more uh, exciting is that they export them and we put them into Tilt Brush. In, so the, the HTC Vive VR set up there's a, an amazing app that google's made called tilt brush oh right and so the kids import their digital buck up into tilt brush <laughs> it's awesome they scale it up to life size we put it on a virtual pacific ocean and we've even got the the correct constellations above. And so nice. <laughs> they, they sail their vaca on a Pacific Ocean and we teach them how to use stellar navigation as a way to sail. And this is in two hours. This is a two-hour experience. That's pretty amazing. So I think the difference between that and looking at a picture of a boat model is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that was some of the creative ways we started approaching particularly emergent technologies like VR and AR um, and 3D scanning. We, we treated all these technologies as ways to extend the physical, um, not, not a distraction from the real. So if you, if you think about museums, they don't want people looking at screens the whole time. Got, they've got amazing objects right in front of you that you, they want you to look at. So we, we're, we're using exploring technology that extends on the real. So mm. HoloLens and um, a few of the other AR systems. We've got to ask, what are you using? So you've mentioned Tinkercad I and Tilt Brush. That technology list uh, that we are putting together right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're using a bunch of things. Um, if you Actually, the, probably the easiest way to follow up on this, or if you're listening, uh, is to go to my blog. So... Um, Matt with two T's, richards.info. And in there, you'll see some posts I've made which actually list all the tools and the things we use. But I'll give you a, a, a couple of examples. So um, so we use Tinkercad. Uh, we use Minecraft. We use Makey Makeys. We use um, Raspberry Pi robots. Uh, we've got 3D printers. We've got 3D scanners. We've got a really high-tech one called a Space Spider, just to be extra cool. But we've also got... These ones that attach to iPads, just called iSense, which I like even more, and they're a fraction of the cost. And so kids use those to, like, scan the, the taxidermy animals that we've got. So in the lab, we've got a whole bunch of taxidermy animals, and they're called the, the handling collection. So so when objects get a bit long in the tooth, no pun intended, they, <laughs> they give them to the lab, and the kids can actually handle them and play with them. So... This isn't looking at something behind glass and reading the boring little plaque underneath. Touching it. Yeah. yeah, this is, and 3D scanning it with an iPad and then uploading it to Sketchfab or 3D printing it or putting it into VR and creating an environment around it in three dimensions. So the tools that we use most are ones that are collaborative. So for VR, um, we, we use a lot of Sculptor VR, which is S-C-U-L-P-T-R-V-R. And um, if you look at that, it, you can find it on Steam and it works with a few different headsets. But what's really cool about Sculptor VR is that it's it's collaborative from geo-remote participants. So what that means is you can have kids in the lab and kids in London and kids in Melbourne all working on the same creation at the same time in real time. So these are technologies that are taking those four Cs to the next level. They're, they're transformative. So um, that's the area that we're interested in. Um, we do a lot of work with special needs um, groups and, and exploring how technology can increase equity of access and creativity. There's a group in Wellington uh, called Alpha Artists, and they're 
artists with um, special needs and, and different disabilities. And they've been coming in and um, creating these amazing uh, digital sculptures, I, I suppose you'd call them. I just think that we've, we've got these tools now to, to create and collaborate in ways that were never possible. And I think that's what's exciting. That's really, really cool. I've got to ask you about the bleeding edge. Yeah. So you mentioned VR. I'd like to know what your thoughts or well, I'd like to know what you're going to do with AR. Well, we've been, yeah, so AR is uh, augmented reality. Um, VR obviously is virtual reality. So AR is when you can still see the real around you, but there's digital things that are overlaid on top of that. And we've been doing um, some exploration uh, with the HoloLens. We got one of the beta sort of sets of that to explore. So what is that, Matt? It's a big headset visor. So you put it on your head and it looks like you're wearing like Robocop sunglasses. There's this huge big visor around your face. And you can see through those screens to what's around you in the room but there's little mirrors that, that shine down onto the glass. And so you can see the solar system floating in your, you know, your lab just in front of you. Oh, or, projection. Yeah, that's right. Is it any good? Does it work? Yeah, it actually, it does work. And I think what, what I'm excited about is what it, 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 it's giving a hint of what's coming. So, so when you use the HoloLens, it's, it's really cool. Um, there are some limitations so that what you can see is the digital overlay is only sort of like through a about a letterbox um, field of view. So it's not totally immersive. Um, okay. It does, it's not wrap around like you can almost get with VR. It's, it's a bit more limited. It responds really, really well to voice and uh, hand gestures, which I really like. So to open up the menu, you sort of you have your fingers pinched together in front of your face and then you sort of open your fingers up and that's called the bloom gesture. So it's like a minority report. Exactly. Right? And so, yeah, <laughs> so it, it uses what, – what I like about it is it's um, – Intuitive. So the technology more and more is using more of the physical body as a control mechanism and less and less do we have to have these clunky little controllers or keyboards or we don't need peripherals so much anymore. And so what that does is it, it, it accelerates the creative process. So, so when you're creating something, you don't have to worry too much about how to get to different menus to do things. It's responding in ways that are intuitive. So you, you expand something by moving your two hands apart and you rotate by pretending like you had a basketball in the air in your hands. And it, I think that's good. I think what's needed and where they're heading, because I've been um, talking to a couple of mates in Microsoft recently, is making these AR experiences collaborative. So what, what was really cool about VR when it first came out, particularly if you tried Tilt Brush, which is a great experience, was you could do, do these amazing creations, but then you are kind of lonely in there. Like you, you, you can share it online, sure, but, but you want to bring your mummy in and go, Mom, look what I made, you know, and hmm. you, you, can't, you can't do that. And so, um, or you couldn't do that until um, they released that Sculptor VR that I talked about and Tilt Brush is getting a multiplayer update soon. But the, the AR that I've used to this point doesn't have collaboration built in. And so I think that's key to choosing the tech you want to use because to my mind, something only really becomes super useful once it's collaborative, once multiple people can use it at the same time then it really comes into its own. So I don't think AR is quite there yet, but I think it will be. And I think once it is, that'll transform how people learn together in those augmented ways. Um, Matt, I've got a couple of questions, um, maybe not totally relevant one to the other, but see how we go. So first, do you think that we are pushing too much technology uh, into our kids' educational lives. So we depend too much on like, high-tech, especially high-tech. When we talk about AR and, and VR, we're no longer talking about just uh, the Google search to check on Wikipedia or on a particular article. So really deep into high-tech. And then the second part of my question, uh, slightly related, is it uh, are we replacing human teachers with uh, cyberspace in, in one of his many forms? Um, okay, yeah, I think they're two really good questions. The first one about do we have too much tech, I think we've kind of gone beyond that now. I think that 
maybe 10 years ago, we could kind of think in that dichotomy of going tech and, and no tech, but it's ubiquitous now. So there's no, you, you can't separate things of being tech and no tech. I think that we, we live in a world that is hyper-connected. We've got this thing called the internet, which dramatically changed our access to knowledge and has the potential to revolutionize all systems and economies in the in the globe currently. So my answer is no. I don't think that that we need to be afraid of too much tech. What I think we need to be focusing on is how we use tech to create preferred futures. So if we just focus on technology for its own benefit, then yeah, sure, maybe we've got something to worry about. I think if we think about how we can use technology to make the world a better place. I'm a huge fan of Buckminster Fuller. And um, there's a quote from Buckminster Fuller that I use a lot when I do my presentations. And it says, and you can look him up if you don't know who mm-hmm. Buckminster Fuller is. It's now highly feasible to take care of everybody on earth at a higher standard of living than any have ever known It no longer has to be you or me. Selfish is unnecessary. War is obsolete. It's a matter of converting the high technology from weaponry to livingry. And I think that, for me, sums up the whole maker education movement. If we can channel this, you know, into something constructive and positive. I think the difference between, say, the the post-technological age, I don't know if such a term exists, but prior to this age, is that we are... It seems to me that we are entering uh, a time where there is abundance instead of scarcity of pretty much everything. Uh, definitely information, but also in pretty much all material goods mm. as well. Like search, research shows that there's plenty of food for everybody to be fat on this planet. Uh, oil uh, is not as necessary as it used to be. Toys. Toys. Anybody with kids just knows that toys so I think just multiply. <laughs> the the maker revolution, revolution also shows that there's abundance in pretty much everything. And then imagination is the only constraint. But I think that technology then comes in it and just allows us to imagine things that would be unimaginable a while ago and then to turn them into reality as well. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that technology has the capacity to, to free us again. And I think that... We've been in this consumerist, uh, you know, unlimited growth model for, for too long. And so mm. if, if we think of technology as a consumable and you just got to get the latest model phone because you need it, or if, if you think like that, I think that's just playing to the old model. What, what I'm excited about is how technology can empower individuals and communities again. So things like uh, the blockchain, transparent ledgers, um, ways of bypassing the fat cats that have just been, you know, creaming off everyone else. I think that we've got the tech to do that now, um, but we need people to become passionate about this and and to wake up. And I think that the greatest tool to do that is the internet and through technology. But I think you, you may agree. I think we've never been more connected, but we've also in some senses never been more isolated in our uh, social bubbles. So we've all got these social networks now that repeat back to us our own belief systems. Yep. So that is why I think these social spaces are so important and why I think in answering your second question, I don't think we'll, we'll ever lose the need for humans because that's what a makerspace is. A makerspace is the people. It's, it's not the 3D printers. It's not the makey makeys. It's not the robots. It's the passionate people, both students and teachers, all learners coming together to help each other, to, to learn from each other, to, to figure out how to fix their phone or to figure out how to fix their bicycle. It's, it's empowering people to be creators rather than just consumers. Yeah. Is that how we become digital citizens? In order to, to grasp that bright future, we need to have the right tools, which basically is technology and good understanding. So is that what you mean by digital citizenship in a couple of your blog posts? Yeah, I um I like the 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 broader definition of digital, digital citizenship. So coming from schools, you'll hear the term used a lot in like it equates to cyber safety. You know that old paradigm mm-hmm. of um be afraid the internet's a scary place. Big that problem. kind of yeah. So I think I prefer to be in 
the solution rather than looking at the problem. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. the solution is, is that we want to empower learners to be making the right decisions for themselves. So w- when I used to do um, digital citizenship talks to parent groups and things, I used to use the analogy of um, if you kept your child in a cardboard box next to a busy highway their whole life until they were 18 years old and then you let them get out when they were 18 they'd probably wander across that highway and get hit by a semi-trailer. Whereas if you were holding their hand as they crossed the road the first few times and then showed them, actually, there's a walkway that goes across over the top there, as they were getting older, far less likely to have problems. Mm. So the reality of it is most people don't have filters. Most people don't have safety mechanisms in their homes. Every person eventually is going to have a a web connected device that'll give them access to whatever so we need to take an empowerment approach rather than a control approach Mm -hmm. and so i think the real definition of digital citizenship is when we actually start having a voice about issues that affect the commons by using the internet so People are coming out now with truly effective ways of voting online, using the blockchain of ways of having a voice, you know, rather than having to go through these corrupt old systems. For our listeners, what is the blockchain? In a Ooh, okay. <laughs> That's a I, hard one. Make it no, in 30 seconds. I, I, I've got, I've got a, a brief answer to that now. So I, <laughs> yep. I always use the... Um, uh, symbolism of a well, it's not it's what it is it's a it's a transparent ledger so it's a way that everyone can have a record of all the translations that have happened uh, interactions that have happened um, and it can be verified to be valid or invalid so instead of having a central authority that says this happened or this didn't happen and that can be corrupt by the way it's everyone has a copy of of all the the interactions that have happened and it's verified so basically the blockchain is a way of equalizing the playing field everyone can be connected to everyone so there's um i think it was western australia a a suburb in western australia that was using the blockchain to share their solar energy that they were creating in their suburb so Every house in the suburb had solar panels. And rather than selling it back to the power company for whatever pittance they were paying or they, they were sharing it with each other between their houses. Maybe, maybe Mr. Smith at the top of the street, he's got 20 panels and he makes more than he needs. Uh, but Mr. Jones down the end of the street, he's only got six panels and doesn't use as much. If Mr. Smith gave Mr. Jones some of his energy, that was registered in the blockchain and everyone could see that. So it's a way of stopping corruption, basically, and and it, and we can use it for everything. We use it for voting. And it's transparent. Like it's a transparent means yeah. of yeah. sharing yeah. information. So that's part of the security that's built into the blockchain system. Everybody has got a copy. That's right. And the issue I've heard about it is that if it gets too successful, you then end up with so many transactions that Take you effectively vote. need to be yeah. or have the infrastructure of a bank enable uh, to be able to. Well, send the, and receive. The Bitcoin the, blockchain right now is about yeah. 30 or 40 gigabytes. Yes, So that size. is part of the problem of adopting your own wallet, at least. Yeah. You, you don't have to have your own Yeah, I, I don't pretend to be a, um, a blockchain or a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency expert, but um, but my friend Kieran Nolan from Australia, he's a ed tech educator at uh, Warana Park Primary. He's actually one of the most knowledgeable guys about blockchain that there is. Um, he was in the, the Sydney Morning Herald recently, actually, for um, a student came from Singapore. His dad moved in from Singapore to Warana Park Primary um, to, to do the programs there because they were learning about the blockchain and AI. And so anyway, we went all through the papers and it made Bitcoin magazine and all the rest of it. But if you really, it, it's, it, it's super interesting, actually, for educational applications. So I'd suggest in a future podcast, get a hold of Kieran Nolan. I can give you his deets it's later. On our list. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I, I find cryptocurrencies and cryptography in general uh, extremely fascinating for not just the mathematics in it, but also the so, promise that it has, you know, for democratizing how information is used, even currencies and social all those things. Yeah. Mm. So it's pretty awesome. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we're going to explore <laughs> it later in, in our podcast. 
So we would like to move into a few rapid fire questions. Oh, already? <laughs> yeah. I know this is <laughs> it's gone really fast. Like I thought we started like five minutes ago. Uh, it's, it's, been been a, it's been a really, really good talk, guys. <laughs> I've enjoyed this. All right. So, Marcus, do you want to start? I would love to know what what's going to be the bleeding edge in a year. It's hard to predict five years, twenty years out. What do you think is this going is to a be the question? Oh, so yeah. So, yes, no type of response is fine. <laughs> uh, no, Chris no, is yes. <laughs> no. Um, uh, bleeding edge in terms of educational technology or just in general? Both, either or, whatever you Let's prefer. say educational, since it's an educational podcast, right? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or technology, how it is applied to education, one would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ooh, that's um, in the next year. I think there'll be far more educational products that are used a lot, utilizing VR and AR, particularly AR, because Apple and Android have just released their AR kits, um, SDK kits, um, or whatever they're called, for for people to develop educational products using those systems. So I think that is going to be probably in the next year one of the big things. Uh, something else I'm more excited about uh, as well is um, uh, modular, simple uh, creation tools like um, the new Lego Spark. There's a, um, a new Lego kit that is is really easy to just make numerous different configurations and code it using like a blockly drag and drop kind of interface. I think that is really cool as well and and means that learning can happen in the context of an hour even. Um, like when when at the Mind Lab um, when I was working there and we did a um, build your own robot program and we, we had eight kids uh, between the ages of six and eight creating robots uh, from scratch completely from nothing and so we we ordered all the parts from aliexpress came on a slow boat from china and um we got the kids to design 3d print the bodies um, of these arduino robots and then they um they customized them to look how they wanted it to look and they programmed them themselves using blockly and some some actual code that took like eight weeks right to do that seeing them for an hour and a half every week well wow. you can you can achieve the same outputs now with some of these kits that are out there in far less time and um i think that's kind of exciting <laughs> everything is getting faster and, um, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, think, <laughs> I, I think it's good to remember because there's a there's a whole bunch of just like um entertainment toys that are sort of being promoted as educational toys and i think as a teacher particularly you've got to really navigate what's what's worthy and what's not and and my one suggestion to teachers listening is um get one of the thing and test it first obviously so if you're going to if you're going to try a sphero to see if that can be a learning tool get one first before you get a class set of anything marcus is, is very excited yeah i've got to ask uh, <laughs> what "Quote unquote learning toys." Would you uh, stay clear of? There's a whole bunch of robot kits out there that don't have that much learning involved. When you actually construct the robot to start with, I think there's some learning there. But it's basically once it's created, it's just a toy, and there's not much learning from just driving a tractor around on the floor. So I'd be looking for things where they the students have to use higher order thinking skills as part of the activity to do it, um, and where possible, choose technologies that are creative. So you're not making a pre-scripted product that you follow the instructions to make. It's like, well, what can you make with this breadboard and this Edison and those LED lights and some sticky tape and two paddle pop sticks? What what can you make with that? I think that's more of a exciting challenge than buying yeah. it something out of as a pre-made kit with only maybe two or three configurations. There's going to be some freedom embedded into the educational, let's call it a toy or object. Yeah, or tool. I think it, the, the more hackable it is, the better. So, yep. so do we know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And like we used to actually um, hack our, our old Android phones in the lab and I'd show the, the kids how to create their own ROMs. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of hacking to learn. I think that's a great, great way to work. Hey, Matt, I've got another quick question. Um, yep. Uh, you are a very creative person. Like, uh, it's obviously you are aware of what's happening around you. You look at the news, you read books, and you design um, learning experiences. 
what kind of technology do you use to do all that? And I'm talking about uh, creative technologies or technologies that help you prioritize perhaps um, record key design, any any such thing that programming language, programming languages, uh, things like Evernote, Trello, um, but yeah. it could be something completely different. Um, so I, yeah, I use a, a bunch of different tools for different purposes, but I've been. Um, to show how platform agnostic I am, I'm a Google certified innovator and I'm a Microsoft innovative educator expert. <laughs> and I, I don't, I'm not a fanboy of any one mm-hmm. particular system. Um, I'm, I, I like to use the tools that are best at what they do. So, so obviously I use the Google, um, tools a fair bit, um, as my kind of default for documents and, um, Keep for notes and Google Hangouts for video conferencing and things like that. But at our in my current team, we use Slack as our communication channel, and um, well, we've just um, launched Trello as a way to um, manage our projects. See, I'm working now with the um, museum renewal team, so that that's the team that redoes the whole museum piece by piece so it does art and then it does natural environments and so there's a lot of people working across a lot of different things and so using a tool like Trello is quite useful and then in terms of research I've I've got a few feeds that I obviously like and on both Android and in Chrome I use FeedMesh is my um, my feed um, system that I can you know have all my RSS feeds. That's for your blogs, right? The blogs that you follow. Yeah. So the tools just manage the blog. Yeah, yeah, like a blog manager. And, yep. and I suppose I spend probably, I don't know, a couple of hours a day researching, looking at stuff. I think that's kind of key, really. If you want to stay abreast of what's happening, you've got to, you've got to be learning all the time. Right. And then you're also producing blog posts. I can see your, your website. Are there any other, sorry, your blog. Are there any yeah. other places where you contribute uh, posts or articles that people can find you and, and read your stuff? Um, yeah, the, the main place I tell everyone to go, obviously, is my blog because I link everything there. So, yeah, mattrichards.info. Um, mm-hmm. And if you, if you hit on About Matt, there's a tab. And in there, it's got all of the articles I've posted on every different publication, magazine. Um, it's got all of my presentations I've ever done as well that you can, I've, I've shared the Google presentation links. You can look at those if you're interested. But I've, I've been published in quite a few different places. So that's the place to look to find it. Obviously, I'm big on using social. So I use LinkedIn and Twitter. My Twitter handle is Sir Matt Richards. I'm I'm actually a knight of the realm. Um, ah, well, oh, okay. dude, congratulations! <laughs> That's amazing. Did Tony Abbott do that? How did she do that? <laughs> it was a bit of a joke. Well, um, it I was shouldn't ask that really because it's obvious why. <laughs> no, it was a, it was a while ago, and I was um, congrats. That's amazing. It's his, his so that is our first uh, sir, right? He's a, well, naturally, I, naturally, yeah. I, I did it as part of an experiment to show that um, online you can create your own identity to, yes. to be whatever you want. Well, and, I'm going to um, call you Sir Matt from now on. Yeah, no, a lot of people do, and you'll be surprised what it's got me into. Um, I've actually had preferential treatment uh, on Upgrade ferry rides. Yeah, 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 it's amazing. So just call yourself Sir or Lord. I suppose you could be Lord. Um, that would work as well. Super mega overlord. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I might do that myself. I like doctor is okay, but I think sir is better. <laughs> <laughs> so this amazing. Oh, uh, well, um uh, that's that's something I was just going to ask you. What would you advise a new student, uh, new teachers going out you now into the field for the first time? Uh, I suppose that's one of the advice, uh, <laughs> so you can make up your identity. Uh, what what else would you advise new teachers? I think uh, most teachers realise once they start teaching that the real learning about what a teacher is happens on the job. So. A lot of those eight-page lesson plans and other ridiculous things they get you to do when you're studying are pretty much useless. And um, I, I remember my one of my favourite lecturers um, at Newcastle University, um, he said, I, I prefer to use the three-step technique for lesson planning. And so everyone's ears sort of perked up. And he said, um, the last three steps before I walk into the classroom, I decide what I'm going to do. And I'm like, yes, you are the man. And so I think that would be my advice would be 
be spontaneous and and trust yourself and follow your passions. So I think the best teachers are the ones that exude passion. They're the ones that 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 really care about things. So that do that. And if you don't feel that as a teacher, get out and do something else. Until you get it, until you get the passion. Yeah, yeah, it's a calling. You know, being a teacher is hard work. So unless you actually love what you're doing, don't do it. Do something that you do care about. Yeah, that's great advice uh, in general, not just for teachers. Yeah, totally. Awesome. I, ne- I never thought I'd be this excited about working in a museum, but I can. <laughs> I, I swear that the, this job has been the best job I've ever had. Well, you know, museums are not what they used to be. <laughs> oh man, I think that. I think if I was to try to describe museum now, I'd say they've got two main objectives. One is to preserve the past, and I think the other is to create the future. Mm. And I think that there's. There's not many places, publicly owned places out there anymore that really care about these things. I think there's yeah. so many people care more about your wallet than they do about you. And so I think public things like museums, libraries, we need to cherish those places. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. I think um, another message from this podcast is uh, subscribe to your local museum or museums. Support. Totally, totally. Yeah. And, Just and go to them. Just yeah, and, well, they're not constrained as much as different places. So mm. there's quite a few amazing museums out there. Like I know um, ACME, um, ACMI, Australian Centre of the Moving Images, going through a transformation now, and I think that'll be quite exciting in a couple of years what they do. So, yeah, definitely get out and visit a museum or a gallery. You won't be disappointed. Hmm. Awesome. Well, Matt, oh, sorry, sir. Sir, sir Matt, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It was an awesome hour and 15 minutes cool thank you for your time yeah no worries guys awesome great thank you talk (laughs) soon cheers thanks mate bye bye that's all for this episode if you have any questions or suggestions please send them to our email address questions at stemiverse.com and we'd be happy to answer them do you want us to interview someone in particular let us know visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode and subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.